I want to welcome all of you this afternoon to the ESI brief briefing, Hidden in Plain Sight, Buildings as Safe and Resilient Infrastructure. Uh, my name is Jared Blum. I have the honor of serving as chair of the Environmental Energy Study Institute. Uh, our illustrious executive director has allowed me to uh, participate in this one, Carol Warner, who's here for all our briefings, and uh, indeed there have been many. Uh, for those of you who don't know uh, about ESI, maybe this might be your first briefing. I think there may be one or two of you who've not been here before. Uh, we've been around for about 35 years. We were the visionary product of a uh, bipartisan group of Congress, Congress people in the uh, mid-80s. And since that time, we've been providing a forum for constructive and positive solutions to pressing environmental energy problems, which, of course, uh, resilient infrastructure is one of those. How do, we, how do we create them? How do we fund them? Uh, but first of all, thank everybody for coming to this, this day's event. I think most of you may recall the one that we had scheduled, ironic as it may appear, uh, was canceled due to um, inclement weather, wind, wind gusts, which we've not seen in the city in quite a long time. Um, ESI is proud to present a series of briefings on this issue with respect to uh, building safe and resilient infrastructure uh, with our partner, the National Association of State Energy Offices. Uh, and they've been with us now. This is our seventh briefing. Um, I'm pleased to see we've had great turnouts, literally standing room only for, for all of them. And, and the fact is, this issue is an interdisciplinary challenge. I mean, whether you are a a contractor, an architect, an engineer, a landscaper, an urban planner, uh, a policymaker, a city council person. Um, it, it is something that spans multidisciplines. And what we're trying to do today is to create um, a forum where we have a, a couple of a pieces of the, that puzzle, so to speak, that will come and speak to us today. And uh, I think we've got a great, a great group for you. Before we do that, I would like to thank Congressman Welch for uh, sponsoring our room today and the Polyisocyanurate Insulation Manufacturers Association, that's a, that's a mouthful, for, uh, and the EEP Dam Roofing Association for our lunches. Um, Mark Fowler from Congressman Wel Welch's office is here to speak to us real briefly about the High Performance Building Caucus. Mark, you want to take a couple moments? Great. Well, thanks, Jared. And thanks, Ellen and Carol and the EESI team for organizing everything and to our panelists for, uh, for joining. I just wanted to quickly mention the Congressional High Performance Building Caucus. Uh, it's a caucus chaired by my boss, Congressman Welch, and Congressman David McKinley from West Virginia. And it's focused on a lot of the similar issues that we're going to be dealing with today. So things like, you know, what policies help make sustainable buildings? Um, how do we improve the resiliency and energy efficiency? of buildings. And we have some great downtown partners uh, made up of everyone from engineers to installers to insulation manufacturers and many more uh, that we work with. Um, we'd love to have all of your bosses join. And again, my name is Mark Fowler, if I can answer any questions about that. So thanks and look forward to the presentation. Thanks, Mark. Thanks very much. And, th and thank you for your boss's support and participation in the caucus. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's not an easy job to try and do these briefings and try and bring in all the, the, the necessary parts. I mean, we have had luck in the sense of people have wanted to do this. We've had uh, members of Congress, former members of Congress. We've had city councilmen. We've had admirals and generals uh, who have sat at the table here and have told us about the national security implications of, of a resilient infrastructure. What we're going to do today, we're not going to be talking about a piece of the puzzle that we all are familiar with in terms of the electricity and energy providing parts of the puzzle. We're really focusing more now on how do we stay safe? How do we physically keep the barrier between us as citizens and inhabitants from, how shall we say this, a mother, a mother nature? I guess if nature is a mother, somebody should be arresting her for child abuse because she really is giving us uh, a piece of her mind. Um, what I'd like to do is start off in the, in the speaking uh, uh, order, so to speak. I'd like to start with a, setting the table for us uh, in terms of the 10,000 feet discussion of the, the challenge to the built environment by the changing climate. Um, and I want our first speaker to, to do that. She's with the um, Institute for 
Building Health and Safety. Her name is Deborah Ballin, and I'll read to you a little bit about her. She's very eminently qualified to do this. She joined the Institute for Business and Home Safety in 2008 as the General Counsel and Senior Vice President of Public Policy. She's responsible for all of the IBHS legal matters and oversees a number of important public policy initiatives, including building codes, adaptation, community resilience, and economic incentives for mitigation. Prior to her work with IBHS, Ms. Ballin was the Executive Vice President of Public Policy Management for the American Insurance Association. She developed and implemented policy for AIA's priority federal and state public policy issues. Now, when, when Deborah is done, I'm going to move on to go down from 10,000 feet, and let's get right on the ground, and nothing's more, well, roofing is almost on the ground, Reed, but close. We're going to get to the building. We're going to get to where, where the, the quality of the building materials and the installation, the contracting matters, and we're going to have someone who knows a heck of a lot about that. The Honorable Reed Ribble is the CEO of the National Roofing Contractors Association. Before becoming CEO, Reed served six years in the U.S. House of Representatives. During his tenure, he served on the Agriculture, Transportation, and Infrastructure, real important, Budget and Finance and Foreign Affairs Committees, where he served as Vice Chairman of the Committee on Emerging Threats. During his time in Congress, Reed met with more than 25 heads of state, and his capacity on the Committee of Foreign Affairs traveled extensively throughout Eastern Europe and the Middle East. And batting cleanup, which I'm actually not correct because you're number three. Cleanup would be number four, but we'll give you that title anyway, Paul. Paul Totten is a vice president of WSP and leads the Building Enclosures Division. He has over 21 years of experience in the fields of structural engineering, building enclosure design, and commissioning and building science. He has concentrated his expertise on the evaluation and analysis of heat, air, and moisture transfer and the cumulative effect these elements have on a building components and building operation. He is past co-chair of the Washington, D.C. AIA NIBS Building Enclosure Council, a member of NIBS, ASHRAE, and the USGBC Green Building Council, and a committee member of the National Institute of Building Scientists Guideline 3. We're going to take questions after the three of them present, if we could, as a panel. I will try and moderate as best as I can. So why don't we start off, Deborah? You're the leadoff. You're taller than I am. Uh, Congressman Ribble has suggested uh, that we can invite the standees to take the ch committee chairs uh, behind me. And since I feel he's authorized to do that, I would never have uh, taken it upon myself to do that. But please do that. Unfortunately, the slides are facing the audience right now. So um, you'll have to li if you choose that, you'll have to listen to us. But uh, thank you. Let's see. Let's move me on to me. Um, I'm Deborah Ballin uh, with the Insurance Institute uh, for Business and Home Safety. Uh, and we are a building science organization. So really, it is a pleasure uh, to be here at an event that is focusing um, so directly uh, on the importance of buildings. Uh, buildings are where people live. Buildings are where people work. And they are vital uh, for community resilience and our nation's resilience. Um, so while there are other aspects of resilience that can be talked about, I really love coming and just talking about the buildings. Uh, and the major focus uh, uh, for what we are doing is on the roof. Uh, roofs, uh, as you'll hear a lot about them today from Congressman Ribble, uh, roofs are responsible uh, for more damage uh, than any other part of a building. Uh, the damage to the roof, but also the damage to the interior. If the roof is compromised, uh, pieces of the roof or rooftop equipment can blow off a roof uh, and cause damage to adjacent structures. Um, and one of the things that we say about a building, uh, without a building without a roof uh, in the event of a rainstorm, a severe rainstorm, is really just a big bucket uh, waiting to fill up with water uh, and therefore it becomes uh, uninhabitable or unworkable. So uh, I'm not going to say anything more on, on that other than we work closely with the NRCA and uh, support m everything they do in the resilience space. Uh, and I do look forward to hearing uh, more from what he has to say about it. So here's a video. Let's start with that because people love the IBHS videos. This was actually the video you saw the roof blowing right off. The roof blows off. There goes the building. This was the way we opened uh, the IBHS Research Center uh, in 2010. Uh, we did a side-by-side -side, uh, comparison of a home that was built to the building code in Bloomington, Illinois. 
uh, and one that surpassed the building code uh, by being built to the IBHS fortified standard. And um, I'm happy to report that the one that stayed up was the one that was built to our standard. Um, and here's a commercial one. That one you're going to need to run. This is a commercial analog, and I know Congressman uh, Ribble's organization does a lot uh, with respect to commercial roofs as well. Uh, this was not, uh, uh, we're going to see the back of the building first, and you're going to see what happens uh, to, the, to the doors, the, the roll-up doors. Uh, one was built to a higher standard, and one was built to a common standard. And um, while there wasn't a building code of the Masonry Institute in this case, uh, we did work closely with them. Uh, and um, uh, we're supposed to turn this around in just a second, and you'll see what happens to the common versus the stronger building. There we go. Common versus stronger. Uh, we blew out the windows because that often happens in a high wind event. Uh, and then we went to see what would happen uh, if the uh, interior got pressurized as a result of the windows. The roofing was not as adequate. In fact, it was inadequate, as you can see, on the common side. And if you just wait a minute, you'll see it's not just about the roof. There goes your building. Uh, and it was uh, a, a 10 times more damage uh, to the common side uh, versus the stronger side, as well as a building that is out of business. Um, so it really is about resilience, not only for your building, uh, but for your business, for your community as well. Let's look briefly uh, at the Atlantic hurricane season, uh, which, as you know, uh, was unprecedented uh, in many ways and does underscore uh, the increasing importance uh, of what we are talking about today. Uh, prior to Irma, we had actually done a, a test at the IBHS Research Center. It was actually intended to look at Midwestern construction. Uh, but one of the takeaways uh, that we realized when we looked at that wind performance uh, was that when we had a specimen uh, inside our test chamber uh, and we had closed the interior doors, uh, the building as a whole performed better and obviously uh, the components of it. So um, although the testing, the reports weren't done, we're a research organization, it takes a long time to get from seeing a building blow down to the official uh, uh, report, we said we can't wait on this. Uh, and so we created a quick social media campaign called Close the Doors on Irma. Uh, and the result of that was within a few days before Irma made landfall in Florida, we got 1.2 million hits uh, to, our, uh, to our website where people could see that guidance. Uh, we did crash our website briefly, but that was worth it uh, because it was, uh, it was important mitigation guidance. And it was easy to understand, and it was free. I mean, it was cheap uh, in terms of you know, and you, all you had to do was close your doors. You didn't have to invest a lot. And in addition to sort of the importance of getting information out at the right time when people can use it, um, it we learned a lot about communications, uh, disaster communications, timing, messages, uh, and so forth. And while Irma wasn't as big of a wind problem in Florida because of the strong codes there, uh, you know, millions of people uh, took that guidance and made themselves just a little bit more resilient uh, in the face of that storm. Uh, 2017, as you know, was not just a wind year. Uh, it was also a severe wildfire year, uh, unprecedented uh, uh, wildfires in California. Uh, and this is a map, actually, uh, of Coffee Park, uh, which received a lot of attention, the Northern California fires in, in, in October of 2017. And you can see the red spots uh, are the homes that burned. And um, the interesting thing about it was that the wildfire maps did not consider this a high hazard area. Um, you see that in floods. I mean, you see that in Houston. I mean, parts of Houston that got 50 inches of, uh, of rainfall and therefore obviously flooded were not high hazard. So, you know, we talk about what we know about future weather, um, but what we don't know, you know, is, is as devastating uh, as what our predictions are, and they underscore uh, why being prepared in advance of, uh, of any type of a disaster event um, is, is critical. Because sometimes there's warning in the case of Irma, you could read that guidance and close your doors. Uh, in the case of these wildfires, I mean, they just took off. And you know, I'm sure you all read the reports, people basically being saved by being in their swimming pools. I mean, that's not, um, that's not an ideal uh, way to deal with things. Here's a wildfire video as well. Uh, and 
And a lot of the, 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 the information that we were able to put forward, defensible space, for example, on wildfire, we've done testing of these things. Um, we work very closely with the fire sciences uh, community, uh, and we are able to come out with that, um, you know, both sort of sophisticated research results that help influence codes and standards, uh, but also um, things on defensible space, uh, things on uh, attic vents, uh, the importance of uh, not having wide screens in your attic and not putting flammables in your attic, uh, which then can become the fuel. So um, these are the kinds of things that are important from a communications perspective. Um, and, and then ultimately, you know, in, in your public policy organization, the goal is to really sort of wrap it all up and, and, and make change uh, at a much broader level. But in the meantime, house, we're, we're willing to do house by house combat uh, if, it, if individual homeowners, individual business owners um, can take our guidance and become more resilient. Uh, I mentioned codes and standards. Um, Building codes, for those of you uh, who are not familiar with them, are uh, done by a consensus-based process in the United States, uh, first at a model code level, uh, and then they have to be adopted by individual states. And sometimes that's an acrimonious process. Not all states have them. Uh, in fact, IBHS just released its latest report, which we called Rating the States, and we look at the building codes uh, in all the hurricane-prone areas uh, from Texas to, uh, to Maine. You can find that on our website. I apologize. It, hadn't been released at the time we scheduled this, so I didn't have a slide on that, but, uh, uh, but it's out now. Uh, but we also realized that, that an individual homeowner or an individual business owner can go above code uh, and therefore become more resilient. So we developed uh, a set of uh, standards uh, and a set of uh, inspection uh, requirements that we call fortified uh, that are a way to implement a resilient design that goes above code. It's done at a voluntary level. There's a couple of jurisdictions in Alabama uh, that have required it at their local level. But for the most part, um, we're trying to engage people uh, and business owners to take that extra step, make a small investment uh, in mitigation to become safer and sounder in the event of an event. And you can see we do this uh, uh, at the home level as well as the business level. Uh, the difference between um, the Fortified Program and LEAD, uh, which a lot of you are probably familiar with, um, is twofold. Uh, one, I mentioned we do have an inspection requirement to make sure all the stuff uh, actually gets in. Uh, but, but homes are systems, uh, or buildings are systems, and in order to um, uh, achieve the resilience that you want, you have to do everything in, in a part of the building that is your system. So we have a bronze level, uh, which focuses on the roof, and we've talked very closely uh, with the NRCA. We're talking to them about some possible training uh, in those standards. Uh, to go the next level to silver, which is your doors and windows, uh, and the next level is gold, which is a continuous load path. Uh, and that was one of the things that we tested uh, over the course of the summer against Midwest winds. Um, but you can't, like, protect some of your doors and windows and think that it's all going to work. I mean, I remember talking to my greatest grassroots uh, sort of test case, which is my 90-year-old mother, um, who said, but I got a shutter over my biggest window. You know, isn't that enough? And I said, no, it's not enough, because the wind can break another window in, uh, and that's a problem. So um, we look at the building as a system, and we understand, as our fortified manager says, you don't get what you expect, you get what you inspect. Uh, so we do require that verification um, to show that really your home is stronger uh, than the local code. And here's what a, what a fortified homeowner had to say. And, and you can see, I mean, the challenge that we have um, is convincing people that this is where they should be spending some of their money. We like to say we want people to have a strong, to, to, to understand the value of a strong roof and not just a strong granite countertop. And that's, uh, that's the challenge that we have, sort of the way that homes are bought and sold. Uh, the builders and the real estate uh, agents, except in coastal Alabama, uh, really aren't talking about the value uh, that is really uh, imbued uh, in a fortified home, a stronger home, but, but it's there. Um, so we're in Washington. I wanted to mention some of the political challenges, and perhaps uh, uh, Congressman Ribble will talk about some of these things. But unfortunately, um, you know, there's a lot of gridlock here. It's hard to get done the things that even everyone agrees to, although I'm happy to say uh, that with uh, the, the February uh, budget legislation, they actually did pass uh, both uh, programmatic changes to incentivize states to do better, uh, as well as uh, some additions to mitigation grants. 
Uh, and these are some of the things that uh, certainly we can talk about uh, in terms of really moving forward, finding the win-wins, uh, the Resilient Building Caucus, that's a great kind of thing. It's getting people together, events like this, uh, that ha have people sort of walking away and saying, boy, uh, you know, I, I, I think what I heard today made a lot of sense, and, uh, you know, this is something that we need to think about. How do we make this work from a public policy perspective? Um, so I hope I'm not over my time, but I'm going to pass on the clicker uh, to Congressman Ribble. Thank you very much. A, a, a very important announcement, and that is for those of you that are standing up there and didn't get fed, we did order some additional food, so it should be coming momentarily. Um, I am going to yield the rest of my time back to the Congressman. Uh, well, good, good afternoon. Is it okay if I just talk right from here? You all can hear me? Mark, thanks for, uh, for making the space available. Having been in this role and worked, worked very closely with your boss, I can tell you that uh, Congressman Welch is uh, one, of, one of the best members of this entire body. And I appreciate him making this available. And, and I'm, a, I'm a Republican. He's a Democrat. We're very far apart on a lot of the political issues. But I have a profound respect for, for Congressman Welch. Um, I want to talk a little bit about history, because I think history is important uh, so that we can kind of understand that everything is interconnected. You saw the, some of the video there that was uh, in the IBHS wind tunnel. But I want to take you back to the mid-2000s. In 2004, there were four hurricanes that went through Florida. And then 2005, it, one of those was Hurricane Andrew. And then 2005, you had the big hurricane, Hurricane Katrina, that went through New Orleans. And uh, many of you who were old enough to actually watch that video or maybe live through it, if you're, if you're from Louisiana, uh, you saw the, the, what really became a modern version of an American refugee coming out of their homes that were destroyed, going to the Superdome. At the time, about halfway through that storm, the roof on the Superdome was performing perfectly well. And in fact, that it was a fully adhered EPDM rubber roof that was 60 mils thick. For those of you who don't understand the thickness, think in terms of about 50 pieces of paper compressed together. That's about 60 mils of thickness. That roof was performing perfectly fine, and people were, were secured out of the weather. However, across the street was a high-rise hotel owned either by Marriott, Sheridan, Hyatt, whoever. And as you saw in the windows, as you saw in the video, windows often will break. The windows blew out of that hotel. They then became glass missiles that landed on the roof of the Superdome across the street. When that glass, sharp edge of glass, penetrated the membrane, it now created a flap that could get captured in the wind and off the roof went. That roof probably would have performed even with 150 miles an hour had that, had that debris that had gotten caught up in the air not struck the building. And everything would have been fine. And that's why all of these things matter. It's not just about how good the roof is, because we can put a roof on. I, I, I can tell you with, with great amount of confidence, if you're willing to spend the money, we can put a roof on that will not only last a very long time, 30, 40, 50, 60 years, but we can put a roof on that will hold up in 150 or 160 mile an hour wind. What we can't do and what we haven't been able to do is design a roof that can handle a pane of glass that's four feet by four feet with sharp edges flying at 300 miles an hour into it. And, and so there lies the complexity of, of trying to uh, create a system of resilient buildings in light of what happens around you when a, when a non-resilient building fails. Let's stop and fast forward now to uh, 2017. Two major hurricanes hit the United States. We had uh, the hurricane in Houston, which damaged 300,000 homes. So three, 300,000 homes in Houston have to be replaced. But they don't have to be replaced because of wind. They have to be replaced because of flooding. And so there's no building code per se short of putting the, every single one of those houses in the flood zone. And for those of you who live in New York, you understand it because Hurricane Sandy did something similar, where, where a wind surge pushed water onto the land and brought water into these buildings. And now the buildings have to be replaced. However, the roofs in, in Houston actually held up pretty well. There was very little roof damage there, even though we had winds in excess of 100 miles an hour. Hurricane Irma, on the other hand, 
Class 5 hurricane that hit the key, Florida Keys damaged 150,000 roofs. However, that damage was dramatically reduced compared to what had happened with Hurricane Andrew just a decade or so before. The state of Florida had, had moved very aggressively in coastal regions to increase the building code to, to, in essence, up the game to keep roofs on. Some of the science that's going on at IBHS and their wind tunnel for what, what they're calling a fortified system or fortified home, fortified construction, fortified roofing, has all, been, has all been really good and very insightful for the industry to take a look at. But even then, it's more complicated than just figuring out how to put a roof on that will stay in place. So, for example, you saw that residential home where the entire structure just disappeared once the windows went open and the home next to it stayed intact. Well, that home next to it can stay intact, and I can tell you we can keep a roof intact, but using adhesives and things around perimeters to increase the wind resistance only works if that method of attachment doesn't damage the roof 10, 12, 14 years down the road. So the roofing industry is working with the insurance industry in helping design that fortified system in a way that when we meld components that may not be chemically compatible, and a scientist who's looking at wind can, can think that an adhesive that holds it on is the right thing to do, we can look at that adhesive and say, yeah, ad adhering that is correct, but you can't use that adhesive because we've got a chemical conflict with the two materials. And so getting that, to, getting that right takes a lot of time. And then, quite frankly, our biggest challenge is getting it to a place where it's economically feasible. Now, you could make the argument that anybody living in a coastal region ought to have and live under a code that requires a certain level of resiliency in that building because the rest of the country who does not live on the coast ends up paying for that, as we just saw with a, a congressional appropriation of billions of dollars to pay for Irma and Harvey as well as the hurricane that went through, through Puerto Rico. And, and there's a huge societal cost when this stuff doesn't get done to an idea that we actually know we already know and possess the science to build buildings that will stay in place. And I, I, will, I will tell you, if, if society was willing to pay the price, we could have these things tomorrow. But trying to find an economic model that will work, both for that building owner that is in the wind zone or in a coastal region, and quite frankly, we could even go into states like Oklahoma where there's and, and, and interior Texas where there's huge hail events where you've got too much hail hitting a roof, we, we can design a roof that will hold up to that, but can we get a customer that's willing to pay for it and not pass that cost on to somebody else? And therein, when you start talking in the terms of resiliency, you begin to see the complex nature of coming up with an economic model that works. We live in a society here in the U.S., for those of you who have not traveled abroad, that views buildings and particularly homes much differently than many parts of the world, particularly Europe. If you go into many places in Europe, the, the family home is still multi-generational. So mom and dad buy a home, and the kids end up getting that home from mom and dad, and the grandkids end up getting the, the home from them. And these homes are designed and constructed and built to last hundreds of years. We don't live in that type of society. The United States of America and its citizens have always been extraordinarily mobile. Mobile. They're willing to move around the country to advance their, their careers or their livelihoods. Uh, we have a very diverse uh, uh, country to live in. If you like mountains, you can have mountains. If you get tired of the mountains, you can move inland to a farming area. If you get tired of that, you can move to a coastal region. And Americans have always done that throughout our entire history. And we've been among the most mobile societies in history. And as a result of that, no one wants to spend the, the adequate amount of money that's required to build a resilient home, even though that home possesses everything that they value more than anything else. I can tell you just with unequivocation that I value my children and my wife more than anything in my entire life. Where is it that they reside is, is under that roof and in that building. And, and if we really truly accept the fact that all those things that we value most in life are there, we can finally begin to move the public to a place where they think in terms of longer construction, more sustainable construction, which, by the way, better for the environment. Products are not ending up in the landfill quite as regularly. 
Um, obviously, if a roof is, is uh, being damaged in 15 years and that roof ends up in the landfill, that's not a good thing. Um, if it la that roof lasts 50 years, it's a totally different dynamic. And so getting the public to accept this and then getting codes to adapt uh, like they did very quickly in Florida, because we saw pretty good results. Even though you saw 150,000 homes damaged, um, a lot of those homes were built prior to the code changes. They will now be rebuilt to a different code and will be much more resilient than what they were. As the insurance industry adapts to this changing climate and they begin to have policies that move their, their customers toward a more fortified system, we're going to be able to deal with that in, in an even better manner and have more homes. However, the building codes also must address where homes are located. Rebuilding 300 homes in a flood zone may not be the smartest use of money. Should we be thinking about moving those homes? Should we be thinking about elevating those homes? How do we want to, as a society, address the issue of location in this country as well? And, and all of those things become a challenge. And then I'm going to wrap up my comments with one other, one other uh, point I want to make. At the end of the day, the person most responsible for the quality of that construction is not the roofing company or the construction company that one hires. It's the actual worker that is installing that roof. There is a massive gap in the United States between where a worker starts and the training that's provided. It is almost a totally ad hoc system. And our association is, is moving very quickly into the world of certifications with the desire to certify over 100,000 roofing workers over the next decade, as well as when, we tr when they get a certification, for example, in, in asphalt shingles and they can actually demonstrate the competency to put that roof on, we will also allow them to get a certification in something like Fortified so that the insurance industry can say, we need to have someone who is certified in this discipline to put this roof on in this region of the country. As we begin to do that training and, and close that gap, we can and take some of the human frailty out of it, the mistakes that happen, we will begin to also make an exponential step forward in, in worker quality. That's why education, and for those of you who have bosses on the Education Workforce Committee and looking at apprenticeship programs and technical schools and reinvigorating technical training in, in our high schools, all those things matter because Everybody needs it. And we are now, as, we're, as we sit here today, 20,000 workers short in the roofing industry alone, 300,000 workers short in the U.S. construction industry. And I would be willing to bet if everybody in here was honest with themselves, and you don't have to raise your hands, when your son or daughter was born and you cast your eyes down on that child the very first day and you're looking at this newborn in their bassinet, there's not a person in this room that thought, wow, I hope you grow up to be a roofer. And, and, and we think this way, but we think this way wrongly. These are high paying jobs that require a great deal of technical skill and, and many of those types of work are dangerous. And so it's something that we have to begin societally to change our thinking, to shift the nexus to provide value to the men and women. When you go home tonight and you flip that light switch on in your bedroom, none of you are ever going to think that that light won't come on, while simultaneously none of you also will ever think about the man or woman who wired that light so it comes on every single time. And it comes on every single time. That's the quality of the construction work here in the United States. It's very high quality, but we need to honor the men and women who choose to do it so that more men and women will enter that trade and provide the types of buildings we need. Thanks for having me, and I look forward to the questions afterwards. Congressman, thank you for pointing out that last point, this issue of as we're trying to drive better built buildings, the, the education of the workforce has to come along. And we, at the ESI, we've not, I don't think we've explored that sufficiently. We're going to try and integrate that issue, I think, as we do some additional briefings on this, because you've raised a very, very good point. Paul, clean up, babe. It's like Deborah, I'm vertically challenged. So let's wait a few seconds for my slides to come up. One thing that I think is, is important to think about in our building market is that uh, we have commercial residential buildings. 
we don't necessarily plan for looking at these buildings differently. We don't think about uh, space for shelter in, in a way that it should be. So, I'm off clicker. I think you're going to have to help me with this one. There we go. So as we look at our buildings, um, each, each building has a different purpose. If we look at a stadium or a museum, we, we have the purpose of what the building's used for on a daily basis, but we don't really think of these buildings in the form of a disaster. How can we repurpose these buildings into a place of shelter, protection? Uh, we're spending taxpayer dollars on a lot of these buildings as they get constructed, and so we need to think of them that way. Um, we have to think about our climate change and our codes and our education of how we actually design for the future. Not a single building we design today is actually built for the future. It's built for the past. We design everything to the past. The rate of codes uh, get adopted and debated. It takes six to ten years to get something passed. And by the time it's passed, it's already outdated based on the rate of climate change. So we have to think uh, differently about our building stock. We have to think about um, teaching and training. And Reed's absolutely correct. Education of not only owners of buildings and property owners and facilities managers, but also those that build, construct, and live and occupy these spaces. So what are the basic requirements of any building? The very basic requirements to provide shelter. And yet we don't, we don't think of any building we go into for entertainment or other purposes as a place of shelter. And yet as we saw after Katrina, the Superdome definitely became a large space for shelter in that city. Convention centers, large space for shelter. These areas of assembly could be pre-designed on taxpayer dollars with an infirmary, a hospital, and, and a means to actually shelter people in the case of a storm. We don't think of our infrastructure into these buildings in the same way. Uh, we look at microgridding. Microgridding is not done all over the U.S. We look at how long it takes to get our grid back up, even after a basic windstorm. Um, it, it's amazing at the rate it takes to get something done, because we haven't thought about mic uh, taking things down to a smaller set. Uh, we have to think about our life safety. So we build a lot of glass. Glass is great, allows you to see outside. But glass also becomes a huge projectile issue in almost any event. Earthquake, um, you can have it in fire. If the fire risk is large enough, you're going to blow out glass. We can have it in high wind storms. Where does that glass go? How does it get contained? How does it impact people as they leave a building? What are the safety risks on a curtain wall system when you lose a whole section? How do you load that differently? There's nothing in the code to tell you actually how to design that ahead of time for that event. And then we can think about uh, the user experience. We still need a building that's going to be pleasing, that somebody's going to want to be within. But what is the user experience in the form of a disaster? How do they see that building differently? They don't care how it looks as much. They care how it actually protects them. We have a variety of buildings that we build. Each of them are uh, for different purposes, anything from an office to a school to a large stadium or a museum. And if we look at each of these buildings uh, from an event of how we experience them on a day-to-day -day basis, we go to a school to learn, to be educated about sustainability and different ways of looking at, at the world. But what do we do when that's uh, needed for a shelter? How do we actually use that space differently? Is it pre-built, pre-thought through for resiliency on day one? If we look at our um, museums, the same thing. Can these be used as shelter spaces? Usually with the quality of artifacts in these and the, and the cost of those, they're not seen at that, in that way. But could we find a way of getting to that point? Uh, this is our climate map, uh, as it probably still sits within ASHRAE today. It takes a long time to get the climate data uh, amalgamated and to program it into this map. And so when we actually look at zones around the country, we take the amalgamation of data that's used for our building code. Usually it's a, for energy code, it's 30 years of amalgamation of data. We're designing buildings from an energy standpoint to like 1985, 1990, 2000 standards. We're not designing for 2020, 2030. We have no iteration within the, the way that the code is written today to look at climate mapping moving forward and actually pre using predictive design. This is true with flood maps, although FEMA is updating those more often. It's true with almost any map we use today. Uh, we look at the complexity of our architecture. We take wind loading, for example, from ASC. You take that to any complex architecture building, all the rules of the road in the code do not apply because we're going to get areas where wind's going to be built up based on the architecture. And so we have to think about our buildings and take that step forward, especially as designers in those building, um, in a different way to really think about how do we future-proof these so we're building a 2030 building today rather than a 20. 2000, 1999 building today. Um, climate change has huge effect. If we look at a number of areas of the country, not only are these massive storms, uh, hurricanes actually an issue. If we look at last year's hurricane season, it was interesting. If you looked at the track, we actually could have uh, lost a good portion of Florida. We had eight to ten storms in a row tracking along the same line. 
That is actually going to happen more often, where we see stuff up and down the East Coast, where these storms are going to be iterative rather than singular. They may not be at the same high speed of wind. Um, the same is true with tornadoes. If we look at the, the rate of tornadoes and the, the volume of tornadoes, we're getting a different type of storm event we, we're getting today than if we go back to even 1998, 98, 90, uh, 2000. It's a different pace. And we're not designed for these multiple events, one right after another. We're not designed from a preparedness standpoint to deal with multiple disasters. This country proved that last year. We didn't have enough effort for Puerto Rico. We, we fall apart after two, two disasters. We barely get through one. And so we're not set up for this. We're not set up for the future planning of this in, in infrastructure and buildings. Uh, we look at sh uh, normal rain events. Even if we take Washington, D.C., we're seeing these short duration, heavy volume storms. So we get to a roof, add a couple extra roof drains to move that volume of water faster so we're not flooding out buildings. And that's a simple thing that we've, we recommend on a lot of our design projects. There's a lot of interest in climate variation. There's some simple tools that we can use. Um, some of them have been developed by our national labs, like Oak Ridge, to run an upfront analysis to really assess um, where we're going with moisture drive in buildings, to actually understand uh, where that risk is. The great thing with these tools is you can actually run climate tools through them to look at predictive analysis. And that's something that, as designers, we can do on day one, but we don't usually institute. We don't have enough people trained in how to use this stuff. Uh, we want to look at wind flow. Every time we build a new development, we actually change wind flow around our infrastructure. And yet there's nothing in our code requiring us to evaluate that. When building A is already there, we build building B. From an energy standpoint, from a wind and weather standpoint, we are not required to assess the neighborhood impact of that new building. Um, the same is true with like water table. So we build in the water table, and we build more and more buildings in the water table. We actually shift the height of the water in the water table based on the weight of the building pushing down to drive more water infiltration issues into below grade spaces. Or we like to stick things like emergency generators, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense. We need to look at where we're putting our critical infrastructure for maintenance, and also to get in and out of a building. How do you design the facade to accommodate that? Um, we can look at the responsiveness of the buildings. This is a, a job I did with a good client, Hickok Cole, here in DC, where we looked at a, a, what is the office building of the future? How do we take something we're doing today and make it responsive to climate? So we can take heat off glass. As it gets warmer, the, the, the screen wall for this building would adapt to actually provide more shade in time. And so this is stuff that we can do with existing technology. Uh, we can look at it from a hardening standpoint. We have nanotechnology materials we're developing today that I think we need to put more science behind with the national labs, industry kind of working together, uh, institutions, uh, higher ed institutions tied into that to actually develop stuff that would harden upon impact. So actually, we have a hard exterior shell built into the facade in our glazing system, so we cannot do today. And then we have to understand that uh, all this has got a people importance. People design buildings, they occupy buildings, they construct buildings, they maintain buildings. How often do we teach and train and continue to educate the industry on each of these aspects? Does a, a commercial building owner and their tenants really understand what they need to do in a major disaster? How unprepared are we to get out of a building efficiently? And do we actually know where the nearest next shelter would be for us? There's a lot of life, uh, lives lost and, and damage caused by just not knowing the basics of that. When we look at construction, uh, we see what NRCA is doing with their roofers and trying to get to a certain quantity of those trained. How many other associations in the industry are not even there yet? We don't have the education programs to really push that forward. And a lot of it's still, unfortunately, being uh, focused mostly on residential. We don't nearly see the depth in the commercial market. Uh, the commercial market has always relied on apprenticeship programs, which, by the way, some subs do a great job with within their subcontracting trade. But a lot of times we find that those have fallen off. We don't have the retraining of our, our people to do the work. They don't know what is a resilient detail. Um, from a design standpoint, our design guides um, aren't being funded from a federal government level at a high rate. You know, the last one I worked on was the Building Envelope Design Guide for the National Institute of Building Science. The last major iteration of change was in 2003, and we've been funding that very slowly with small amounts of funding from government agencies. We're not up to speed. We're, not, we're, we're falling off, and it's, it's unfortunate because the money's just not there to do it. We need to see these agencies fund it to allow that to progress. And then we have to understand the workmanship that we see today is quite different than what we've seen in the past. You know, we, we heard the comment on homes in, in Europe and other, other places of the world are really built for generations. We haven't built in this country for generations for a really long time. And we need to get back to that thought process of resiliency. Durability is actually something that lasts more than 10 or 15 years. What we build is sacrificial. Your home should be destroyed by a storm and maybe we'll rebuild it. Rebuilding takes time and the emotional and psychological impacts on people are huge. Um, nobody can ever feel comfortable in that home again because of what's happened. And then we want to think about um, 
more about the importance of what actually happens on a site. Are we actually going through the process of working together to build an actual building? So it's not just the general contractor, it's not the architect, but the process of commissioning actually has an important role. What we're finding today, though, is on some of these jobs, commissioning is the band-aid to a larger problem of not having the upfront education. So if we don't have apprenticeship programs where people are being trained properly, a commissioning agent pointing out deficiencies but not really being able to teach as often, maybe because they're also lacking skill set in, in the way that they're doing the work, can be an issue. However, if we have a well-trained workforce coupled with a well-trained group of commissioning agents, those two things work extremely well together, where the teaching can happen on both ends. So somebody uh, from, uh, from our profession comes out and looks at a building, points out a deficiency, but can also show the worker a better way of doing it. And so it does need to be a twofold front and back end of these jobs to do that education. And with that, I will leave that open to questions. Well, thank, thank you, all three of you. Um, you've, you've demonstrated that we have the technological know-how. Um, the question then becomes, how do we fund it? How do we, how do we get it to be in, in people's DNA? And I guess my question for all three of you to start is, what's the greatest impediment? We talked about building codes and how long it takes from six to eight years, Paul, to get them adopted. Um, are building codes the answer short term? What, what should be done at the federal and the local levels to try and encourage resilience from a public policy standpoint? So maybe I'll take that first. I, I think um, one of the things I, I think is probably more important is, so you can have a code, but the code isn't really going to get you to the point of actually understanding how to implement that code. I actually think education is probably a better spot for us to start everything from STEAM programs at grade and elementary school, so that our future generations actually have a good understanding by the time they hit university of how to do this. We'll have more people interested in construction. Um, construction's getting quite advanced. We're seeing uh, robotics and other ways of actually erecting buildings that are quite difficult to put up, now being implemented around the US and around the world. This does require a larger technical understanding of, of how to run equipment and computers. So I see this crossover actually happening within the industry now but we are not prepared to actually implement it without having enough people educated. So I think education at its core is going to be extremely important. Well, I'm going to shift gears a little bit since here we are in Washington, uh, and I'm going to talk about uh, the importance of understanding the return on mitigation investment. Yeah. Uh, Paul, you mentioned NIBS a few minutes ago. Um, they, uh, that's the National Institute of Building Sciences. Um, they have at least partially, I think they're calling it an interim report, but just uh, updated a 2005 report uh, that looks at uh, the return on federal investments in mitigation, six to one uh, on federal grant dollars, uh, and they looked at private investments uh, that go above code, four to one. Uh, one of those was actually the IBHS Fortified Wind Program, and that was a five to one investment. Um, so I think that, you know, here in, in Congress, um, or in the agencies, they need to understand that these are good investments to make. Um, that these are not partisan investments to make, that these are not foolish investments to make, uh, but that if we want uh, in the long term uh, to, uh, to have a better built environment, uh, that includes building codes, that includes new construction to fortified, but it also includes retrofitting what we have. I think a lot of times we focus on um, putting new stuff up better, and that's very important, but the building stock doesn't turn over uh, very frequently. Uh, and most of what you see, we want here to be for, here for a while, so it's a question of retrofitting. When you get a new roof, re-roof the right way. So um, people don't intuitively understand that, uh, but one way to get them to understand it better is to focus on that return on investment. Congressman? Yeah, I would say two things. First of all, <clears throat> we have to stop hiding the true cost. The cost often gets hidden when, uh, if, if too much taxpayer dollars are involved in the rebuilding, there's not a lot of incentive for building owners to actually own the problem themselves. And uh, that cost gets hidden if someone else is paying, well, there's not uh, the right incentive then to actually do it the correct way. Se secondarily to that, um, there's the old adage, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? And the, the real approach I think you need to take is you take a look at the, that wind map and where where real difficult uh, climate events occur in the country and focus your attention there. 
and you get the biggest return. And then you can begin to spread that to other regions of the country and deal with other climate-related crises. So you start with wind and hurricanes and whatnot along the coastal regions of the, of the southeast. Uh, you then go into the, the central and plain states and deal with hail. You know, you, uh, you get into the tornado zones and deal with that. And you, you do them systematically. And you begin to create a proof example that it actually works as, as you step into it that way. And I think that those two things would, would take us a long way. Thank you. Actually, one of the, I would seem to be one of the best things we could do is have a government that is prepared, so to speak, to deal with this in an interagency way. And I actually, actually, Jeremy Marcus is here from Congressman Cartwright's office. Going to a couple of moments just to make a brief moment comment about uh, your legislation. Uh, well, thanks e ESI again for giving me a, a few minutes to talk about something we've been working on for the last few years um, that we think is a really common sense way for the federal government to help prepare ourselves better for these events. Um, as many of you may know, the GAO for the past um, three high-risk reports, which identify the biggest fiscal vulnerabilities to the federal government, had have identified extreme weather as something the federal government needs to do a better job preparing for. And so um, we've introduced something called the Prepare Act that does really three common sense things that we think could help us better ready ourselves for um, the increased prevalence of extreme weather that we're all seeing. The first um, is an interagency council where we would have um, the folks come together, um, decide the best practices, make sure agencies are doing their work, um, and have a coordinating body for the federal government to look at extreme weather preparedness. The second thing we would do is make sure each agency is make, having their own extreme weather plans and looking at how they're going to fulfill the mission of their agency and how extreme weather will impact their, uh, their mission and how they can fulfill it and what fiscal vulnerabilities they have. And the third is a state and regional approach, both coordinating federal responses. We've talked to a lot of state and regional people and say we have different agencies coming in doing different things, but they aren't necessarily talking to each other. So having regional meetings, having regional plans that focus on the specific needs of each individual area and how they're preparing um, and how they're coordinating with the federal government and how the federal government is getting the best available information out to folks um, on the ground. So um, I'm, I'm pleased to say we have over uh, 60 organizations, think tanks, businesses that have endorsed it. IBHS is one of them that's been a, a big supporter of the bill. Um, we'd love to have the roofers on as well if you're interested. Um, and um, the bill has uh, passed unanimously out of OGR. Um, it was actually supposed to be marked up by TNI last week. It got snowed out. Uh, the irony wasn't lost on us, but um, hopefully uh, it'll be moving through TNI. And we'd love to get anyone here, um, whether from an organization who might want to uh, get more um, information or support it, or you're from an office, um, we're, we're still looking for co-sponsors. Um, it's a bipartisan bill. I think we have about 25 co-sponsors. You, you have hopefully picked up the, the one page on your way in. Um, it's almost evenly split R&D. Um, so we think this is a, a good bipartisan solution that actually is moving, and the federal government can do some real common sense things to be better prepared. So um, yeah, I'll uh, hang out. If anyone wants more information of the bill, I'll, I'll be around afterwards. Happy to chat with anyone about it. Thanks. Do we have, we have time for some questions uh, for any of the panelists? Do we have questions from the audience at this point for the panelists? Yes, sir. Uh, I, this might be for Paul. I'm not sure. I was wondering about hearing a little more about solar on roofs in the future, and, and both as a way to provide decentralized power when there are storms and you lose uh, centralized power options. And I wonder if sol how solar systems have been holding up in these storms and whether they're being designed for these adverse conditions well enough, too. Uh, great. Yeah, I think in looking at um, microgridding, it's not just solar. It's, there's all sorts of technologies we can use for alternative power. And I think in this country, we don't really explore a lot of the other solutions as well. Um, you can look at it from where you are in the region of the, of the U.S., whether wind power or something else might be more, more appropriate. As far as the panels themselves, um, both from a tear-off standpoint and from a, a surface damage standpoint, they don't always do well in super high-end storms. We can see resiliency in that. The difficulty is that the more we build up resiliency on the top, we reduce the performance of the panel. So we have to look at the trade-off. I think it's um, looking at ways of bringing in um, power that's alternative quickly. So whether we have uh, equipment that FEMA or somebody else has on stock 
to deploy large solar arrays quickly uh, after a storm event would probably be more important. Uh, in addition to having that infrastructure set up up front, where we can plug and play either being on building or if it, if it actually happens after a major storm event where that on building is no longer effective, it's off building plugging into the same grid, which I think is a, a better way of planning from a microgridding standpoint. Yeah, we've actually done some testing at our research center about the wind performance of so, uh, commercial solar arrays, you know, on commercial buildings. Uh, and um, some of the results haven't been published yet, but, but there are concerns. Uh, there are concerns about whether they performed uh, to the design wind speed, uh, which we haven't found one yet that has. Um, I should say that we looked at ballasted systems, and, um, you know, we've talked to the roofing uh, industry about that. I mean, can you can you anchor them and then you have problems with the roofing uh, materials? So um, it is a really complicated question uh, about how do you uh, take these systems that were sort of designed for sunny days and that's why they call them solar uh, and understand uh, that, that, that storms happen um, and they really do need to perform better uh, than they potentially do. There aren't a lot of data points out there. Uh, in terms of, um, you know, what's actually happened uh, to them just because of where they've been and where the winds have blown. We were thinking that Sandy uh, would have offered uh, a pretty good, uh, you know, place to look because there are a lot of incentives in New Jersey, uh, but the winds actually in Sandy were not that, uh, are not that great. I'm sure you've got some perspective from the roofers. Yeah, the first um, certification we did was for solar, and uh, we've already got several hundred certified solar installers. However, the problem with, with solar is, again, a, a bit more nuanced. Um, you have to remember that that's a live power plant. I mean, it, it is a, it's a, a power plant that's up on a building. And there's great resistance uh, by the code writing bodies because the fire departments want to know if a fire starts and they have to take water up on that roof and you now have this electricity generating product right there, it creates a whole different level of safety problems. Um, it, it would be our contention that that solar panel is best placed on the ground, not, not up on the roof. And, um, and, and so uh, we, we can, with the right amount of funds, uh, if, if a customer is ready to, to, to pay the money, we can put a solar panel on a roof and it will stay there up to 150 miles an hour. We know that we can do that. We've got the technology to do that. And so it's possible. Solar panel now are built in the roof. It's not on top anymore. It is the roof. Uh, so so there's no such thing as installing on top. Uh, what, what do you mean there's no such thing as installing on top? The, no, the panel's in the roof. Oh, no, I, I understand what you're saying. I'm just telling you that you're wrong. I mean, I, this is my entire life. Um, there, there's one manufacturer that actually makes a panel that is built in as part of the waterproofing, right. but that system is not even code compliant. It's not even legal to install in the country yet. Thank you. We'll, to the back of the... Yes, sir. Young, that's you. The question is, so for the record, uh, how effective are vegetative roofs in performing in, in storms like this? Uh, they, they can perform pretty well, but it, as you're aware, vegetation gets damaged just like it does on the ground, right? And so when you get high wind events, depending on whether that's an intensive or extensive uh, vegetated roof, um, it's a very difficult um, thing to install and, and know for sure that the wind is going to stay there because on, on a four inches of soil media, that's not a lot. You've got sedums that can take the whole thing right off. Uh, if, you, if you get to where you've got 12, 14, 16 inches of, of, um, of soil, and you get bigger trees, well, then the trees themselves can go. Um, but I'm, I'm a big fan of vegetated roofing, not necessarily because of its resilience, although it can, but vegetated roofing is one of our biggest solutions on water problems. You want to prevent water from going down a, a roofing drain and into the storm sewer. Um, one of the best things to do is put four inches of soil on that roof. That will take the first three quarters of an inch of rain. And um, so it's a, it's a fascinating, fascinating approach to it. I like it. We also do have concerns about um, vegetative roofs from a wildfire perspective, uh, you know, because uh, when you're in a drought condition and you can't water, and then there's your fuel right on the roof. 
I mean, we do have standards for both wind and fire, and I, I agree with the concerns. I think one thing to think about with vegetation is that uh, depending on the system, we're seeing a lot of the roofing manufacturers with grid and reinforcing systems for that, that component, but they're not intended to save the plants. You're going to end up with some degree of plant loss on the system. Um, from a fire risk standpoint, um, you know, most of our vegetative roofs actually, there, there's maintenance and irrigation requirements, but if you're in a drought area, it's absolutely assured that you're not going to meet the fire code requirements. Um, and then the third thing I think we need to look at is not only from a landscape architect standpoint of the aesthetic you're trying to achieve, but what's appropriate in the climate you're in for those plants to actually survive. Uh, we have a lot of great vegetative roof designs that are in the wrong climate zone for that, that set of plants. Yes, sir, right here. Thank you. I'm uh, David Hattis with IBTS, and I'd like to come back to the solar question because there's another twist to it in terms of conflict between energy resilience and hurricane resilience. As, as you know, the latest codes require for new buildings in the hurricane zone to be built with either hurricane shutters or with impact glass. And there's a whole industry that has developed to meet that. It's not a retrofit requirement, so older buildings don't have to be brought up. I believe we're seeing solar installations in Texas and in Florida and other places on existing buildings and without a requirement to strengthen the windows for impact protection. And what that means is that if in a hurricane the window breaks, the pressure uplift on the roof increases by about 50%. So it's resisting a 200 mile an hour wind. Uh, can we move into requiring, and of course there's a lot of pressure to, uh, from various sources to put solar on roofs and on buildings. Is it possible to make them aware that there is this additional problem and to require the retrofitting? So I think when we think about buildings, we have to think about them holistically. And we don't necessarily do that in the interrelation between our design. So let's just take the building code. You actually probably could not build a fully to every letter of the building code building ever because each group of the code actually is designing its own bubble. And then the interrelation between those sections make it difficult for us to translate one to the other. What you're bringing up is an actually a great point. We have glazing in a building of varying standards and we're not always required to bring that up to the current code or even look at future code. That implosion of glass changes pressurization in a building, and yet it's not picked up in our roofing standards. It's not picked up in other standards within the building. It's not uh, picked up in fire spread caused by wind, if there's a fire event, electrical fire in the space. That interrelation is important. Um, to get it out in the industry in an education format, we have to understand that in that storm event, we're not designing for that. We're designing everything up to that storm event. Right. There's nothing in our code today that actually designs properly to a storm event. And so for the solar industry and for the roofing industry, yeah, it's going to happen that roof's going to be lost, but their design parameters are based on the building staying intact holistically, and that's the challenge. And even, uh, even on Fortified, if you saw the video that she showed where you had the one building that, that wasn't built to the code and one that was, and the one building blew apart, just imagine if that building was across the street. So you've got a, a, a one home that's built to Fortified or resilient system, but the house across the street is not yet. That one blows up and, and smashes into the building across the street. Now all those windows go on that building, pressurize, the house pressurizes, and you've got a new problem. And, and so um, this is a very, very difficult problem to get to. Um, that's why part of this solution has to be centered around what the new construction codes are. So when entire neighborhoods are built, which you, you see a lot in the coastal regions, that, that all of the homes are built to that standard in that entire neighborhood. Now you're really getting at, at the, the core problem. And so it, it's, a, it's a tough deal when you're having a, a mix and match type of thing. Yeah, one of the things I'm personally very grateful for is that I don't need to understand the politics of solar, uh, which, you know, there's a lot there. Uh, and, you know, when we've done the wind testing that we've done, we've picked up a little bit of it, but, but you know, as, as is the case with many industries, the industry needs to understand there's a problem. Uh, and that's, I don't think the wind performance of solar arrays is the major focus right now. 
uh, of that industry. And, um, you know, until there be, you know, whether um, anecdotal evidence following an event where you see these problems, these are the kinds of things that begin to change minds. But I do not think minds are being changed yet uh, with respect to the wind performance of solar arrays. Ellen, you have a question? Uh, the, the woman uh, raised that point earlier about there are some technologies that integrate solar, uh, roofing technologies that integrate solar, right? So I was thinking if you're going to do a roofing retrofit and you want to get a twofer, perhaps you could look at a, uh, you know, solar shingles or something like that. Um, so I just wanted to ra I absolutely know that there are these other rooftop solar systems, as you say, but I did want to just at least acknowledge that there are these other products coming yeah, in. Yeah, yeah, there are. Um, my, my, my concern, and I, I apologize for being maybe a bit too direct here, my, my concern is that there are none of these yet that are truly code compliant. And uh, it becomes almost a, like an urban legend that these systems can keep both water out and power the home today while simultaneously meeting all the building code, particularly related to fire. These, these panels burn. And um, I'm not even certain that at this point of the technology, technological growth that we're at a place where they should even be mounted on a building yet. And there's a lot for us to learn in, in relationship to that. And listen, my roofing company built solar-powered plants on large commercial buildings. And um, we spent a lot of time looking at trying to figure out how to fully integrate one. Uh, you're starting to see some technologies in Asia, particularly in China and Japan, where they're building solar panels into windows and, and things like that. But all of these create different problems should a catastrophic impact hit that, that now uh, powerized building component that you now have exposed electricity running that's uncontrolled. And uh, even though there's been a lot of marketing, I know Tesla's been working hard on a, on a pure powered shingle, they don't have one that actually works yet. And so we're a we're long, long way away, I think, from getting to where we can have a, a, a integrated, power generated roof that will be truly in, in alignment with the building codes, in part because there's a lot of resistance from other trades and other protective services like the fire departments and police who are very, very concerned about it. Paul, you have a comment? So I think one other thing to think about is that uh, the technologies are improving. We are looking at the wrong component. Uh, we have more roadways and more ground infrastructure that we could actually build into. The technologies in actually paving with, with solar is being used all over China. It's being used in other parts of the U.S. in, in experimental look at this and in Canada, and I think that those technologies integrate it with buildings. So if we lose all of our buildings and we still have our roadways, and, and there's a percentage that are still damaged, the microgridding component of an of a infrastructure component of solar roadways actually is a, an easier thing to deal with and reintegrate back into the power grid. And so I think that that technology could be looked at. Some of the hardening of those components are, are actually things that we could be taken back to the roofing industry. So in five or ten years, we will probably be at a different point with this, but we need to look at this more holistically. You know, if we're, if we're not dealing with a roadway structure that could actually be part of our component, uh, which actually a lot of the emergency groups are, are more comfortable with from that standpoint, uh, we're, we're missing the boat. Yes, sir, in the back. Could you talk about the cost up relative to hardening of buildings, fortification? <coughs> could, you re could you repeat the question? So sure. So code built versus fortified built in the coastal region, for example, in an entire community. What's going to be the dollar cost up, and how's that going to hit the mortgage industry? Um, I can't answer how it's going to hit the mortgage industry, uh, but um, uh, it, it depends. Uh, there isn't an easy answer. It depends on what's your code base, and also, since a lot of it is labor, you know, what are, what are prevailing rate labor costs? So Florida's got a pretty good code. It really doesn't cost that much to get up to... Uh, uh, to, to, to fortified Alabama, I think labor costs are probably lower than they are sort of in the Northeast. So, so that's a cost-effective way. What we say is that you know it's cost-effective, certainly to get a fortified roof when you are re-roofing or roofing for the first time. Uh, Six hundred dollars, eight hundred dollars, you know, for an average-sized uh, home. 
Um, but no one is going to get a new roof just to go fortified. Uh, window and door protections can be done at a, at a relatively inexpensive level in the case of making sure that your plywood is up, uh, you know, all the way up to getting, you know, impact resistant uh, windows, uh, again, at the time of construction versus replacing out all your windows, you know, is very expensive. Uh, the continuous load path uh, in gold is expensive. Again, you'd never retrofit to that, but at the time of construction, it's not that much. Uh, I mentioned Alabama. Uh, Alabama is the most robust market uh, for fortified, uh, you know, anywhere in the country. Uh, they actually put in building codes for fortified in the coastal regions, and then the builders started and the market started recognizing that. And I was uh, down making a visit there a couple of weeks ago. You know, and I went in, in a, in a, you know, a, a neighborhood of $250,000 homes. Uh, and they were all built to the fortified gold standard. Uh, so it, you can do it at different price points, uh, but it has to be done at the right point and in a, and in a sort of uh, deliberate way. To, but to that point, from a commercial standpoint, to your question as to the, the payback, so to speak, what's the, what's the investment? If you are a commercial user and you want your building to, let's say you want to be in business, when you look at some of these flood, uh, flooded communities, you're seeing there are, in fact, retailers and manufacturers who have stayed in business. There is a payback that goes beyond the immediate, you know, whether or not you feel it's worthwhile if you're in a commercial business. So that, that may be a different um, component when you're thinking about doing these retrofits to make a resilient building. Yeah. You know, from a commercial perspective, we think one of the most important things is, is having power generation, you know, a generator. And, and we were in the field uh, uh, following Hurricane Harvey, uh, where it made landfall, not in Houston, uh, and saw just countless businesses that, were, that looked okay. I mean, we didn't have the authority to go into them, but they looked okay, but they were closed because there was no power. Yeah. Uh, and again, to sort of focus on... Uh, the bottom line of the business is staying yeah. in business. Yes, sir. Over the side. If, if I might just ask a follow-up to that. So for the, the homeowner or business owner that, that has a structure built to the fortified standard, is there a, um, a benefit in terms of their in insurance rate being lower? We're an hour and 15 minutes, and we got the first question about <laughs> insurance discounts. You guys, you were slow. Um, there is, uh, you know, it, it, in some states, in Alabama, they actually have put that into their insurance regulatory mechanism. Uh, other states, uh, it, you know, it's whatever the market determines. Uh, and, you know, insurance companies, it's, it's, it's a regulated industry, but it's also a competitive industry. Uh, and they are looking uh, for fortified homes. IBHS actually is developing a database so that they can check that out. Uh, and, and, you know, can respond accordingly in the market. Uh, I don't know what the discounts are in Alabama, uh, but they certainly are enough to sort of keep that, that sort of program moving along, you know, in, in, in all aspects of the market. It, it's interesting, your question, and I, I agree with Derek, it took longer than I thought for the, for, the, for the question to come up, but it's an excellent one, and it, you expand on that question, not just the insurance industry, the credit markets. For example, just as the three people here have said that, that building performance is a systemic issue, it's a, how do you build a systematic approach to resilience, communities, Moody's just came out with a statement yesterday that said that cities that don't have a, a resilience program and are dealing with it from a building standpoint, from a, remember, and you probably guys all know this, that 75, 80, 85 percent of all of the bridges, tunnels, et cetera, that are, that, are, that are part of this infrastructure debate, and by the way, buildings are part of infrastructure, let's not forget that, are owned by the municipality. So what Moody's is saying, if you're not going to take the initiative to become resilient, you're going to pay a higher interest rate on your bond structure. So that's a very important, it's, it's not insurance per se, but it's kind of. So it's kind of an answer to your question. Anybody, else? yes, sir. Um, hi. Uh, maybe I can, oh, great. I mean, I can make myself heard, but um, sure, this works. So um, my question more is on the, I guess, technological side of this process. And forgive my ignorance. This is just I'm not fully aware. Um, where it concerns the, the technology that goes into fortification, what currently exists, when we're talking about populations that um, would expect to see several high-impact events in a calendar year or several high-impact events in several calendar years, um, while it was advocated by this panel that there is, an, there is a return on investment for making those types of um, expenditures. 
how much so is that the case for populations who inevitably are guaranteed to see uh, repeated events year in, year out? So in other words, maybe in, um, I'm a New Yorker, right? So maybe Sandy was the, actually Sandy was the um, greatest uh, environmental event I've seen in my lifetime. Um, but I'm also Puerto Rican, and I understand that Maria was not the, <laughs> was definitely by far not the first uh, massive hurricane um, that the island has seen, by far the worst, uh, again, within my lifetime, but not by far any, with any shortage of frequency and with climate changes being what they are, um, you know, you would expect that these populations would begin to see more events with greater frequency. You know, it, it, uh, that's a great question. Um, and most of the testing that's done uh, is done on new construction. And then the question is not so much having many high impact, but day after day after day. Uh, we actually have sort of one of the less glamorous parts of the IBHS Research Center uh, is what we call our roof aging farm. Uh, and we have a lot of little sort of roofs out there uh, picking up the weather. And we have, you know, weather, weather measurement, you know, devices in every single one. And they look at the temperature every day and they look at the, uh, you know, the rain precipitation and so forth. And at 5, 10, 15, and 20 year increments, we are going to go in and we're going to uh, test those shingles to see how do they perform compared to a new roof. Uh, there's an aging farm probably not far from you in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, some of our member companies, uh, Cincinnati, Ohio, uh, coastal Alabama, and Kansas City. Um, so we, we are testing that. I think that the, um, the place where you see that frequency the most is with respect to hail. Um, and uh, because it doesn't take a lot of hail to result in a roof replacement. Even, and, and so um, uh, we, we're actually developing a, a hail standard, an asphalt uh, shingle hail standard to, to try to get a better sense of that. Uh, but really one of the questions I think that people ask, and we don't know the answer, you know, is, um, you know, it's great to have a 30-year roof, but if there's going to be hail damage, you know, every seven years or, or, or whatever, um, does it pay to make that investment? And, and I, don't, I, I, don't, I don't know, how, how do you guys answer that? Um, yeah, I think it does. Um, the, the, there's, a, there's a market tension that occurs on the hail side. Then I'll talk a little bit about the wind. The market tension on the hail side is if a consumer buys a new roof for their home and they buy a, a roof that's impact resistant, what the industry would call class four, that'll take a hailstone up to about two inches. So it's a pretty, pretty good impact. If they buy that and they have it and now eight or nine years later, you know, that roof has maybe got some mold on it, not looking all that good, but totally performing exactly the way the manufacturer was, a new hail event comes through. All their neighbors are getting brand new roofs paid for by the insurance industry. The, their adjuster comes up and says, nothing wrong with your roof. They almost view that as a negative, the consumer does. They, 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 they don't mind the disruption for the most part about replacing a roof because of hail because they can be planned and you can do it when it's not raining and people don't have to move out of their home. Wind is a totally different animal. And uh, when, when you get into a post-hurricane or wind event, uh, let me just describe what Fortified looks like for, for those. Uh, you tear that old roof off on an asphalt shingle roof. You reattach the deck with either ring shank or screws so that that deck now stays, the plywood sheeting now stays on. You then put a water shedding underlayment there so that if the shingles would blow off, there's something that will shed the water off. It, this is all about water mitigation. If the roof goes, that's the cheap part of this for, for the homeowner and for the insurance industry. It's when water gets into that home, that family has to leave the house and live someplace else. Now the carpet and there's gonna be mold mitigation and all that's gotta be done because water got inside. So you, so you put in a, a, a more durable underlayment under those shingles and then you install the shingles but you increase the attachment by 40%. 
Instead of four nails to a shingle, you go with six. Instead of having an unadhered perimeter, you adhere the perimeters where wind can get at it. Uh, and you do things like that. So it's not horribly expensive to, to do. I think your $600 to $1,200 number, depending on the size of the house, is right. I think the insurance industry still has to do a little bit of arm wrestling about do you include that over the garages or carports, for example. Is it worth it to that consumer to do it there? And um, but But... Those are relatively low in cost types of fixes since the laborer is already there, you know. Um, so it's not a big thing. And someone asked about the home mortgage industry. Um, they're actually very much in favor of Fortified because remember, they're the true owner of that property till the property is paid for. And they're not particularly interested in having a storm damaged property that um, is either underinsured or the people can't afford deductibles or what have you. I'm big fans of it. Paul? So one thing I wanted to add is, is we have the upfront cost of a first-time install. And if we're looking at a, a region where we know we're going to have multiple events, we should have a long-term uh, setup of cost in our revenue stream, looking at ongoing maintenance, and then long-term planning for partial and full roof replacement at a frequency that we expect those major storm events. And I think that's something we don't plan for today. You know, we're planning for that initial install, and if it's damaged, we're going to go back with a new install. Um, we can't predict the degree of damage we're going to have on the buildings. So depending on the site, the location, the size of the building, the way that the glass and glazing may fail, the way that the roof may fail may be not easy to predict. But if we have uh, broadcast out with inflation some idea of revenue cost, at least we can look at the rate of replacement, uh, the amount of time the building's left open and not conditioned, and the amount of damage that can be driven by mold and other things growing in it isn't, isn't well understood. So if we look at even after Katrina, a lot of the buildings that were left unoccupied were due to mold growth, rapid mold growth inside the building. Uh, on drywall and other finishes. And so you have these large commercial buildings that just aren't unable to be used because the cost of remediation to remove all that and provide a clean, healthy building is too expensive. I would, I would also add to that when we talk about the amount of debris that gets caught up in, in a windborne environment, even if we had an entire neighborhood that was built to a resilient level, you have to take a look at the landscaping design as well. Because if a tree gets airborne and it hits the home, it can become a tumbling effect as well. And, and so there's a lot of issues centered around this entire thing to actually have a true resilient neighborhood. Thank you very much. I, I just want to end. I think we're close to the end. Are there any more questions at this point? Uh, by thanking the panel, I think this has been incredibly informative. I think everybody now understands the hidden in plain sight kind of beginning of our, of our title and the critical role that buildings, resilient buildings play to our infrastructure. We're going to keep that in mind as we get further down the road on the infrastructure debate. I mean, it's all systemic. It's all working together. Communities working together, and buildings are a big part of that. So thanks again. I want to thank our panel. <laughs>